more than 20 years ago. I started getting this bad stomach pain that happened every time I ate something. She said that the um, cheekbones were flattened. The nose bone was not visible at all. The pinky fingers on both hands, the third digit the, the, was missing from the pinky. I uh, decided that I was going to run from God and I was never going to let anybody have that much control uh, to hurt me that much ever again. His ribs were busted, his sternum was busted. One hip was crushed and the femur was broken real close. And the nurse had told, told my wife later, says people younger would die. You do not have to motivate God to heal. God wants to heal more than you want to be healed. Don't miss God Wants You Well, coming next week on Gospel Truth with Andrew Wallach. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. You know, today is what is typically called Good Friday. Uh, it's the day that they say that Jesus was crucified on before Resurrection Sunday. Uh, personally, I believe that Jesus said that he was going to be three days and three nights in the earth the way that Jonah was in the whale's belly. And so I personally don't believe that Jesus was crucified on Friday the way that it's traditional. But, you know, that's really a detail. The point is that the crucifixion did take place, and this coming Sunday is when we talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And out of all of the things that we celebrate. Of course, we make a big deal out of Christmas. I believe a lot of that is because of the selfish benefit that comes to us. People get presents and it's exciting and we have all of the other things involved with it. But really, the uh, resurrection of the Lord Jesus is actually the highest uh, celebration in the Christian faith because everything revolves around the resurrection. I just wanted to take today's broadcast and just dedicate it to sharing some simple truths about the resurrection, which, like Luke said, these things that are most surely believed among us. You know, we say that we believe in the resurrection, but there's a lot of people that couldn't actually uh, nail it down. They couldn't say where these scriptures are. They aren't really familiar with this. And I just want to take this opportunity to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and therefore the resurrection of us because we are going to be guaranteed a resurrection because Jesus was resurrected. Let me share these passages with you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul was talking about the resurrection, and there were people who were critical, saying that Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead. And here's his response to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And here in verse 14 would be the conclusion. If Christ isn't risen, it says, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. And so basically he's just saying that if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, well then the whole Christian faith is basically uh, flawed and untrustworthy because the foundation truth in the gospel is that Jesus was crucified for our sins and buried and resurrected on the third day. And if that's what we've been testifying, that this is the truth, and it turns out that that wasn't the truth, well then the whole message is suspect. So that's the point that he's, being, that he's making. In verse 16 he says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. In other words, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, well then there is no verification that what he came to accomplish was really done. Now I just want to focus on this for a second. Because, you know, there is no other religion on the face of the earth that has this concept of a Savior in the first place, but then of the founder of that religion actually rising from the dead. You can go to the tomb of any other religious person that founded the Islamic faith, the Buddhist faith, all of these kind of things, and they are still in their tomb. 
But you know what? Jesus' tomb is empty because he was raised from the dead. And what that was was the ultimate verification, validation that his message was true, that what he claimed he could do, he did because he overcame death. And there is no other religion, there is no other founder of any religion or of any philosophical, uh, you know, uh, doctrine that can even make a claim like this. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the pivotal thing. It's kind of like the nail that the rest of Christianity hangs upon. And if that nail was to fall out, well, then everything else is hinged upon that. I tell you, the resurrection of Jesus is a fact. There is historical fact that documents it. Even from the secular unbelievers, they had to admit and report that the body was gone. And, of course, they came up with ex, uh, explanations as to why it was gone. But there was never any proof that somebody stole the body away or did anything. The truth is that uh, the Lord resurrected. Matter of fact, the four soldiers that were at the tomb came and reported to the Jews that angels had appeared unto them and that the tomb was open and that Jesus was resurrected. The very people sent there to guard and keep somebody from stealing that actually became the first witnesses to the resurrection. And think about this. The way that Satan tried to make it, he put these soldiers there to keep people from coming and stealing away the body and therefore reporting that Jesus was resurrected from the dead when he really wasn't. And without knowing it, Satan actually made the confirmation of the resurrection of Jesus a more sure thing because here were Roman soldiers guarding the tomb to prevent anybody from stealing the body. So there is no way that somebody snuck in. There is no way that this was done by his disciples. They could not have overcome these soldiers. So these soldiers are verified that this wasn't just his disciples, some radical group, that it, but it was God Almighty sent his angels and resurrected his son from the dead. And because Jesus is resurrected from the dead, therefore our faith is not vain. We have a strong confidence and a strong faith because we know the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There's a number of other scriptures here that are really important, but let me just skip on down for time's sake here and, and deal with some other scriptures about the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 35, it says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. In other words, Paul is anticipating people saying, all right, if people are going to be raised from the dead, what are they going to look like? What's their body going to be like? And because they can't totally comprehend, and there is no explanation in Scripture that is just so detailed that it would remove all doubt, since they aren't sure what the body is going to be like in a resurrection, then they say, well, then how do we know that there's going to be a resurrection? And Paul says, you're a fool for thinking that way. And then he begins to use the example of a kernel of wheat or corn or any other kind of seed that you plant. You plant a seed that is like this, but then it turns out totally different when it, it sprouts and grows up. For instance, you take an acorn and you plant that and it turns into this huge oak tree. It's just amazing how that that little seed has within it this huge thing. But the point is that, you know, in the natural realm, we sow a seed like this and it grows up and becomes something else, and yet we accept that. He said in the same way, you have to accept that this physical body, when it dies, that's like planting it in the ground, and it's going to sprout up and we're going to receive a glorified body. We don't know all of the details about it, but we can rest assured that it is going to happen and that we are going to receive this glorified body. In verse 37, he says, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beast, another flesh of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. In other words, there's going to be heavenly bodies that we inhabit, a glorified body throughout eternity, just like we've had a physical terrestrial body right here. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. We are acquainted with this physical body here, but the glorified body, we aren't yet acquainted with it, but there is going to be a body, and it will have its own glory. I believe it will be greater than the... Uh, 
glory, the, you know, the wonder that we see in God's creation here in this physical body, the glorified celestial body will even be greater than that. In verse 41, it says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now, he begins to make a number of comparisons here between this physical mortal body and our immortal body that we will have throughout all eternity. And notice these comparisons. He says here in verse 42 that this physical body is corruption, but the glorified body is going to be incorruption. Man, we could talk about that for a long time. But just think of all of the ways that these physical bodies... I mean, it's a wonderful creation of God. You know, I've seen some, some of these things on television where it explores the wonders of your body and how your body functions and does things like this, and it's just amazing. I mean, the design of God is just something that uh, amazes me every time I get more detail, more understanding about how our bodies work. But as good as all of that is, this physical body is subject to corruption. I mean, physically, we die, we have sickness, we have disease, we have uh, paralyzing things that hit us, and beyond just those physical things, think of the, the sin, the immorality, all of these things that come in and defile our bodies. This physical body is subject to corruption, but our glorified body is going to be incorruptible. Boy, that is awesome to think. There will never be sickness, there will never be disease, there won't be any of the sin and the things that destroy. There won't be the pain, the suffering. All of those things are gone. That's powerful. In verse 43, it says, It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Now, again, you know, we can look at some things in this physical realm, this physical body, and think about the honor and the glory. There's some people that are just dignified, carried themselves well. They accomplish things. There are people who are renowned for their heroism that they've done. But in comparison to what our glorified body is going to be like, the existence there, this life at its best is dishonor compared to the honor that we're going to receive in our glorified body. It says in verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. I think there's a lot of things I could say on this, but you know, we are just so limited in this natural realm. You can't do certain things because we've got natural laws that govern us. For instance, this physical body can only be in one place at one time. I can't walk through a wall or walk through a rock. But in Jesus' glorified body, he could just instantly be gone in somewhere else. He could walk inside of a room when all of the windows and the doors were locked. And apparently, he could just go through things. There aren't the same limitations on a, sp on a spiritual body that there are on this physical body. In verse 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. This last Adam is speaking of Jesus. And he was a spiritual man. And then when he was resurrected, he received this spiritual body. There is going to be a huge difference between this physical body that we now inhabit and our glorified spiritual body. Praise God. In verse 46, it says, Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. This is just saying, well, the next verse says it in verse 49. It says, And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. This is just saying in the same way that none of you are only part human. You don't just have some of the attributes of a human body. If you are alive at this moment, you are human. You bear that image of a physical human body. And in the same way that all of us are human here in this physical body, when we resurrect, we are all going to bear the image of Jesus. It says over in 1 John chapter 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's saying that right now, we are the sons of God, and we, we don't yet see the physical manifestation of this glorified body and of all of the things that we're going to have throughout all eternity. But we know that when he appears, Jesus, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye is what it says. And we are going to become like Jesus. And so in the same way as we've all been like just physical, natural man here in this life, in the future life, when we are resurrected, those of us who know Jesus, we are going to be like him. We are going to have that glorified body that's able to go from place to place that isn't going to be limited by the same limitations that we have in this physical body. Man, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be glorious. And so he said in verse 50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, he had already said previously here that these are corruptible bodies, that these are um, flesh and blood, and we have to become spirit in our glorified body. So he's just saying that we can't truly enter into heaven as long as we have these physical bodies. You know, this is my own opinion. I, I could spend a lot more time developing this, but here's just a, an opinion I have that like when the Lord told Moses that no man can see me and live, and so he had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock, Exodus chapter 32, and put his hand over him, and then Moses was able to see his back parts. But he says, no man can see me in my face and live. I believe that what he's talking about, it's not that God would kill you. It's just that these physical bodies could not contain the glory of just even seeing the Lord, much less when we get resurrected and we have that glory revealed in us and we are perfected in living in perfection. These physical bodies just aren't equipped for that. That's just like saying that, you know, you can't live underwater. Artificially, you could do it. You could have some kind of a submarine or some kind of a sphere that you're in and you could pump air down there, but it's all temporary. You couldn't just take a person and put them in water and have them live there because they're out of their element. We weren't made to do that. You can't take a fish out of the sea and make him live on the land. He wasn't made to do that. These physical bodies are incapable of existing in glory and in perfect union with God. Now, through the Spirit, we can have relationship with God, but these mortal bodies are incapable of dwelling in eternity. And so, this mortal has to be changed into immortality. We have to receive this new body. You know, when you understand this correctly, instead of looking at death and thinking what a tragic thing, although I don't believe that God ever intended death for mankind. He intended us to live eternally. But after sin entered in, for those of us who've sinned, which is all of us, did you know that death is actually a positive thing? I know some of you may struggle because you only th see things in this life and you look at death as being the end, it's over, it's tragic. But the truth is that we could never exist in that other realm, in glory, in the spiritual realm with God and have the oneness with God that the Bible promises if it wasn't for the end of this physical life and the beginning of a resurrected life and a glorified body. If you see it properly, it's actually a transition into something far better than what we've got. So he said this in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal should have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. It says, death is swallowed up in victory. And if you were to turn over there at Isaiah 25, 8, it goes on to say, and he shall wipe all tears away from our eyes. That's quoted in other places in the New Testament. But this is talking about that God has totally destroyed the victory that was in death. It says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 
The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what? For the Christian, for those of you who've been born again, you know, death is still not what God originally intended for us, but because of our own choosing, we ushered death into this world. But Jesus came and bore our death, not only physical, but spiritual death for us. And even though we physically die, we don't have to live in a state of damnation and separation from God. But uh, for the believer who dies, he instantly goes into the presence of God. Let me show you some scriptures on this out of Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that's a good attitude. Most people think that living now is all gain. That's everything. We, we want to prolong our life as long as we possibly can. But the Apostle Paul said, to me, to live is Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about serving the Lord. And to die is even better. He goes on to say in verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Now, he was writing from prison. He was being persecuted for preaching the gospel. And he says, if I keep living here in this life, then staying in prison seems to be where I am. You know, when Paul went to a new town, he didn't go look at the Days Inn or the Holiday Inn or the Marriott or some other hotel. He always checked out the jail because eventually he knew he was going to wind up there. That's where Paul always wound up. And he says, this is the fruit of my labor, being in prison. And he says, yet what I shall choose I want not, for I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul said that he had such a longing to be able to exist with God without the limitations and the hindrances of this flesh, this old self that lusts after things contrary to God, that is dominated by our feelings and by our emotions. He had such a longing to be in that new state of being where there was no limitations, no hindrances, he longed for that so much that he said he was literally struggling whether he should live or die. He said it actually was more appealing to him to die and to go be with the Lord than it was to live in this life. But he was going to stay here in this body at this writing. He was going to stay here in this body even though it was costing him imprisonment and punishment, rejection, because it was needful for other people. You know, that's a good attitude. If you really understand the power of the resurrection and what it's all about. If we could really get a glimpse of what it's like on that other side to live in a body that isn't corruptible, that doesn't have the pain and the suffering and the grief and the anger and the bitterness and the corruption that's in the mind and in the soul realm. If we could truly get a picture of what heaven is like, I guarantee you'd be like the Apostle Paul. You'd have a hard time staying in the flesh. You know, there was an instance many years ago where I had a person give me a little book, and I read this book, and it was written in the 1890s by a woman who in the 1850s was on her deathbed, and um, she had this experience where, you know, from our perspective, the people who were standing around her, she was only gone just a brief period of time, just a few minutes, that she quit having her vital signs. But during that period of time, her experience, what she experienced in the spirit realm, was that she was ushered into heaven. She had people that she knew uh, who had already died and gone to heaven that ushered her in, that helped, ex helped her explore heaven. And in her vision that she had, she was in heaven for three years. And she just began to describe the beauties and the wonders of heaven. And of course, it wasn't I don't believe a perfect description. I don't believe that you can convey in words everything that is on the other side. But nonetheless, by me reading her account and just seeing what she experienced in this spirit realm, for her experience, it looked like she was up there for three years. And then she came back into this body. Did you know after reading that, it literally affected me to such a degree that for a few months, I struggled to even want to live here on this earth. Man, I was thinking about, boy, if this is what heaven is like, I'm ready for it now. And I mean, it really affected me. And when I got home, my wife unpacked my suitcase and she found this book 
And of course, I was at the office doing some things. When I got home, I found my wife sitting there with the same look in her eyes that I had in mine. It had affected her the same way. I just don't think that most of us have really understood about the power of the resurrection and what it's going to be like. But I tell you, it's going to be awesome. Uh, there's another scripture that goes along with this, Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. It says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now think about that. He says the sufferings of this present world, they aren't even worthy. They are so insignificant compared to the glory that is waiting for us in resurrection that we shouldn't even make a comparison. You know what this says? There's times that I've seen things on the Holocaust, people who have suffered, tragedy that has been done. You see some of these things and your heart just breaks for people. And you wonder, God, how could this be? Even if they get to heaven, even if these people wind up in heaven, how could they ever get over this? Well, see, that's looking at things from just this side and us thinking only about the physical realm. But the scriptures, if you really look at it, heaven is so awesome. Our resurrected body is going to be so wonderful. The union and the relationship, the fellowship with God is going to be so intense, thousands of times greater than anything we've ever experienced here, that in comparison, there isn't even going to be any comparison to it. The sufferings of this present world aren't even worthy of mentioning compared to the glory we have revealed. You know, that's the hope of the resurrection. And if there's any of you that don't truly know the Lord Jesus Christ and don't have an assurance about the resurrection and you don't know for sure where you're going or where, you're, where your loved ones have gone, you need to settle that today. I encourage you that you need to invite Jesus into your life. You need to make sure that this coming Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, it isn't just a historical fact but it's something that is real and that you're looking forward to. Today's program is available on a single CD or it's available on a DVD made from Andrew's daily TV broadcast. Each is available for a gift of any amount when you contact the ministry. Your gifts help Andrew bring the almost too good to be true news of the gospel into countless homes every day. This teaching is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on audio teachings on the left-hand side of the page. We'd also like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith is available in hardback for £12.50. Request book T228. Our helpline is closed today to allow our employees to celebrate the holiday. But you can always visit our website where you can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. Be sure to watch Andrew's special series titled, God Wants You Well. It all begins Monday right here on Gospel Truth.